Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see you all, especially on this Sunday. And uh, it's great to have uh, Edwin on the organ. Edwin, thank you for being with us again to lead us uh, in our singing. And I've got an invitation as we begin our service from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. So we've got this great first hymn, all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Let's stand and sing together. and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Christ, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Let us sit or kneel. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. 
renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and say Psalm 14 together. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord, but there they are overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please do be seated and Peter's going to bring our reading. reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 49, from verses 29 through to chapter 50, through to the um, end of Genesis. The death of Jacob. Then he gave them these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron, the Hittite. The cave in the field of Machpelah, the Amamri, in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron, the Hittite, along with the field. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried there. Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried, and there I buried thee. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favour in your eyes, Speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, my father made me swear an oath and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father as he made you swear to do. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him the dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. When they reached the threshing floor of Atad near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly. And there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. When the Canaanites who lived there saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, The Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That is why that place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizram. So Jacob's sons did as he had com commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, 
near Mamre, which Abraham had bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite, along with the field. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. Joseph reassures his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in threatening you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide you for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The death of Joseph. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Here at the end of the reading. Thanks. Uh, God, thanks be to God. <laughs> you can have a look at that little passage. Well, big passage, actually. Uh, but let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, at the end of most Hollywood movies, the hero rides off into the sunset. In the Bible, most of the heroes uh, just die. And that's what we've got here in our reading, uh, Genesis, the death of two of the Bible's heroes, uh, Jacob and Joseph. Death is the atmosphere of these uh, closing verses of the book. So we have words like wept, embalmed, mourned, buried, died, dead, coffin, coming well over 30 times. Um, back in Genesis 12, we started this series, not at Genesis 12, but that's where this whole family started that we're looking at this morning. Back in Genesis 12, God called Abraham uh, to start a new nation. And uh, God promised that through Abraham and this nation, the whole world uh, would be blessed. Um, and so it's proved to be true, hasn't it? Uh, today, um, we have uh, millions of Christians all over the world. Jesus uh, called uh, this nation the kingdom of God. And so there are millions of us all over the world this morning, uh, worshiping like we are, singing like we are, uh, confessing our sins. And because this kingdom is now huge, and it all started here 4,000 years ago uh, in the book of Genesis. Genesis 50 uh, is the fourth generation, um, and they're beginning to die. And when there is a death in a family, uh, tensions and fears often come to the surface. I've noticed that over the years. Uh, and that's what happens here in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, uh, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back? Now, there's nothing unusual about that, is there? Uh, we're all in families, we all know what it's like. Uh, I took a funeral for a friend last year, um, and the night before, uh, the undertaker phoned me up, and he said, um, I've, there are quite a few tensions in the family. I said, I'm just warning, I think there could be a punch-up at the funeral uh, tomorrow. So I said, well, bring your biggest men along. <laughs> and, uh, but nothing happened, of course, it normally doesn't. So what are the tensions here in Genesis 50? 
amongst God's people. We're going to focus on verses 15 to 21, where there's a real contrast in the family. So we have the brothers who are full of guilt uh, for the way they've treated Joseph. And in contrast, Joseph seems to be able to forgive them so freely uh, and so easily. I assume there'll be a contrast among us this morning in how we handle guilt. Uh, and our relationship with other people. So I want to ask two questions. Uh, how did the brothers get rid of their guilt? Uh, and why was uh, Joseph, Joseph uh, able to help them uh, with their guilt? So three things that we can learn from the brothers. This is very quick. It's very obvious. I've never actually seen it, how, what a good way it is to deal with guilt, this passage. Uh, I think it may be one of the best in the Bible. Uh, I can't think of a better one, because it just shows us how they dealt uh, with their guilt. So three things we can learn from the uh, brothers. Uh, first of all, they made contact in verse 16. They sent word to Joseph. They got in touch. Uh, and this really is the fundamental thing, as far as I can see. If we have guilt in our lives between us and God or between us and other people, we make a step towards the person where the guilt is. Jesus says exactly the same thing. He says, if you're on your way to offer a sacrifice and there's trouble between you and so on, go and sort it out. So guilt is not something we play around with. We make contact and deal with it. And then the second thing they did was they admitted their guilt. Uh, so in the name of Jacob, they sent a message. I don't think Jacob ever made this, uh, sent this message, but anyway, uh, you can work that out um, yourself. But in verse 17, this is the message they sent. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in uh, treating you so badly. They're very honest, aren't they, about their guilt. So they mention their sins twice. They mention their wrongs twice. They talk about forgiveness twice. And that seems to be a feature all through the Bible, that people, when they come to God to confess their guilt, uh, they tell it how it is. Um, I, found, I, do, I must say, I have found that so good to be honest with God, that I'm an obnoxious, nasty little man. You know, because that's the truth, really. If you knew what was in my heart, you wouldn't be listening to me this morning, probably. And if I knew what was in your heart, I probably wouldn't be talking to you, because that's how we are. Uh, we have this guilt issue. Psychiatrists tell us we've got a guilt complex. Um, and so it is a, a, to be human is to be guilty. Um, and then the third thing they did uh, was that they surrendered to Joseph, verse 18. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. Now, that is full surrender, isn't it? They couldn't be more uh, open and surrendering to Joseph than with that action and that, uh, those words. I suppose the question is, was it safe to do that? Was it safe to make themselves so vulnerable? Because remember, Joseph, by this stage, was really an African dictator. Uh, Egypt is classified as part of being of Africa. And you don't mess around with African dictators. Uh, and so Joseph had real power here. So was this a wise thing for them to do? I mean, as Christians, uh, we talk about surrendering to Jesus Christ. Paul talked about himself as a slave of Christ. Uh, people often came in front of Christ and fell down uh, before him uh, as their Lord. Is it safe? I mean, uh, is this a, a safe thing to do, to offer ourselves to Christ? So that leads us to our second question. Why was Joseph their saviour from guilt? Um, over the last few months, we've been looking at Joseph and like some of the other Old Testament heroes, uh, he's reminded us of Jesus Christ. And that's what you see as you go through the Old Testament. We get people who, yes, Jesus is a bit like that. Yeah, Jesus is like that. 
And so we, we build up a picture of what the Saviour is going to be like who is coming. And so it is here in verses 19 to 21. Joseph reminds us that of Christ, the Saviour, who can take away our guilt. That's very good news, uh, because we all have a guilt complex uh, this morning. We may have been trusting Christ for years, but we still struggle with guilt. I think there are times when it, it can be hard to believe that Christ, as he hung on that cross, carried all our sin and took our place. There can be times when it is hard, almost too good to be true, that God will forgive all our failures and all that's wrong in our lives. Well, you know, those skeletons we have in the cupboard or those secret sins. The event that has happened in the past that we're deeply ashamed of. But that's the promise. That's what the Bible says. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And of course, Joseph could look, can look too good to be true. He's so amazingly kind to these brothers. So I want to notice two th things about Joseph uh, as a saviour and how he reminds us of our own saviour. The first one is that Joseph did not act like God. So verse 19. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Now, when the, jo the brothers came to him, they were clearly scared stiff. Uh, Joseph made it clear, though, to them that he's not in the place of God. Although Joseph had massive power in Egypt, uh, he did not want to use that power in his relationship with his brothers. But he did not want to judge them. He understood the biblical principle that God is in charge. It's what the Bible says. God says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And that's right, isn't it? I mean, it's just, the Bible tells us again, the Lord who judges, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Very easy for us just to step into the place of God and judge people and to judge ourselves as well. We're very good at doing this. So judgment is coming, but it's God's responsibility, not ours. That's what Joseph shows us. Today, we're called to forgive people, not judge them. Yet C.S. Lewis reminds us, it's not always easy. He says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Uh, forgiveness can appear to be so unfair I think that's why it's so easy for us to be judgmental. Uh, what about Clement and Lucian Freud, two brothers, uh, famous brothers? As young men, they had a race across uh, Hampstead Heath. And uh, Lucian was convinced that Clement uh, cheated uh, in the race across Hampstead Heath. Uh, and the result was he wouldn't speak uh, to Clement ever again for the rest of his life. And he didn't because of that race. Joseph, of course, also had every reason to be judgmental to his brothers, every reason not to ever speak to them again. But he refused to take the place of God. He refused to condemn them. Jesus was the same. Jesus made it very clear that he came to this world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. He was God, but he always submitted to God as his father. Yes, he's going to return as judge, and saviour. But today he's the saviour. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day of cleansing. Today is the day when whosoever will may come. It doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, where we've been. Today is the day of forgiveness. Christ said that. And it'll remain like that until he returns. And just like the brothers who came to Joseph, we, we also need to come regularly to Christ uh, and know this cleansing. That's why it's so good to have a confession every Sunday. It's the one part of a service I would never stop uh, is the confession. And it's a, it's a good habit to get into. Most mornings I thank God for what happened yesterday and I confess my sins. 
I, I find it's a really healthy way to live. And that's what we're learning here um, about the brothers. But then the second thing about Joseph is that Joseph understood God's sovereign grace. Verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We must notice there that Joseph does not minimize their sin, does he? You intended to harm me. And they did harm Joseph. They sold him to international traffickers. The traffickers then sold Joseph in Egypt to a man called Potiphar. Potiphar then put Joseph in prison for many years. The brothers were evil to Joseph. The brothers were wicked. They almost wrecked his life. Joseph then gives us one of the great buts of the Bible. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives. You see, Joseph was God's savior for the Middle East. There was a great famine, but God in his grace, God in his love, sent a rescuer called Joseph. And so thousands were kept alive because of Joseph. But isn't the cross an even greater example of God's grace? This applies, this verse applies uh, in an even more wonderful way. What's the worst thing we've ever done in this world? What is the darkest moment of history? It has to be the day we crucified our creator. I can't think of a worse day than that when we nailed him to a cross. We intended to harm him, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives. So that there are, are many of us all over the world who've come to the cross of Christ. And we've come with all our guilt, all our failure, all our sin. And like the brothers in verse 18, we have received forgiveness from Christ. There's no place like the cross for getting rid of our guilt. Because Jesus, as both God and man, is the perfect savior. He carried our sin, he took our judgment, and he took our place. So that today, we can transfer all our guilt onto Christ. That's the, that's the promise, that's the amazing promise of the Christian gospel. There's no need for anyone anywhere to ever be guilty. Perhaps we've never bowed down before Christ as Savior. Or perhaps it's a long time since we confessed our sins. Or perhaps some of us have feelings of guilt that just seem to haunt us and we can't deal with them. Well, let's follow the example of the brothers. Let's make contact with Christ the Savior. Fall down before him. And we will find someone, just like Joseph, who will not judge us, but accept us. Someone who will not harm us, but do good to us. And someone who promises there in verse 21 to provide for us, to reassure us, and to be kind to us. It's a wonderful picture of the Savior. 2,000 years before he ever came, and yet we see that he's just like Joseph. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you this morning as the savior of the world. We thank you that the death, your death, was sufficient to take away all our sin. You know our hearts, you know our failures, you know our weaknesses. But we thank you that you promised that your blood will wash away all that is wrong. We praise you and we thank you. Amen. Let's sing again. Uh, God has spoken by his prophets.
Let's declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please do now sit or kneel for prayer, and Cedric is going to lead us. The Collect for today. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being members of your church, your kingdom. We pray that all members of your kingdom, your church, may contact one another, confess, surrender in confidence, not judging, but forgiving. We pray particularly for uh, your church in this country, giving thanks for the General Synod just finished and praying that you will raise up new members for the new Synod in the elections so that your will may be done. We thank you today particularly for our friends in the church in Fulbrook, dedicated to St. James. Pray for their unity together, contacting, confessing, surrendering in confidence. Pray that that part of your kingdom will grow and flourish and bring your word to more and more people in Fulbrook. We give you thanks, particularly this morning, Heavenly Father, for the gift of music, for those who provide it, for the privilege of being able to sing together once more. And we pray that you will help us to discern and discover your will for us, your plan for us and your purposes, giving us and all your church the courage and determination to obey your direction. We pray for the whole world here, Lord, for which our Lord Jesus died. Praying for all the people in Tokyo for the Olympic Games. Praying for safety there. Sportsmanship and fair play. And we pray that you will protect all involved from any mishap, injury, or disease. And we pray in the world for all those suffering from extreme weather conditions, wherever they may be. Praying that they may know relief and pray for all those working to help them. In this country, we pray for all on holiday, pray for safe travel, that they may have rela relaxation and enjoyment with friends and family, and come back refreshed. Heavenly Father, we do pray this morning for all those known to us who are sick in any way with COVID or any other problems. Bring them before you, Lord, 
those particularly known to us here in Burford or further afield. And we bring before you, Lord, today and this coming week, all that we have to do, the conversations that we will have, all the contacts that we will make. Pray for your guidance, for your hand upon us. Help us to surrender to you every day. So gathering our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we come to our final hymn, King of glory, King of peace, I will love thee. Our final prayer. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>